Good morning, good afternoon. It is a great pleasure to welcome all of you to the online conference, Courts and Global Norms on Freedom of Expression. The conference is hosted by the World Leaders Forum and Columbia Global Freedom of Expression, an initiative funded in 2014 by President Lee C. Bollinger that seeks to advance understanding of international norms, institutions, and jurisprudence that protect freedom of expression and free flow of information. President Bollinger will open the conference followed by two sessions with a 10 minute break between them. The first session moderated by Dr. Dana Schmalz from the Max Planck Institute for Comparative Public Law and International Law will address the application of international legal standards and comparative law practices in deciding upon freedom of expression cases. The second session, moderated by Professor Rubio Marin of the University of Sevilla, will be about the challenges for judicial protection of freedom of expression in the digital sphere. The conference will be closed by final remarks from Catalina Botero from Columbia Global Freedom of Expression Initiative. Please join me now in hearing some words from Lee C. Bollinger. Bollinger became Columbia's 19th president in 2002 and is the longest serving Ivy League president. He's Columbia's first set law professor of the university, a member of the law school faculty, and one of the nation's foremost First Amendment scholars. President Bollinger is also a member of the Pulitzer Prize Board and a co-founder of the Knight First Amendment Institute at Columbia University, a center devoted to defending speech and press freedoms in the digital age through litigation, scholarship, and public education. Thank you. I would like to welcome you to this World Leaders Forum event, co-sponsored by Columbia Global Freedom of Expression. And I'd like to begin by thanking the Honorable Justices who are here today from courts across Africa, the Americas, Asia, and Europe. I'd also like to thank our moderators. And I'm grateful to the teams of the World Leaders Forum and Columbia Global Freedom of Expression, particularly Catalina Botero, for their work in organizing this conference. Finally, I'd like to express my gratitude to UNESCO for all the work it's done in partnering with Columbia Global Freedom of Expression and in supporting this event. It's a great pleasure to join you for what I believe will be a series of illuminating conversations among prominent judges serving in domestic, regional, and international human rights courts. Before we begin, I'd like to give you a little background on the co-sponsor of this event, Columbia Global Freedom of Expression. I established this project in 2014 to bring together experts and activists with faculty and students to advance understanding of international norms that protect freedom of expression and the free flow of information. I appointed Agnes Calamard, who recently joined Amnesty International to serve as Secretary General. The project was founded with a mission to foster dialogue among domestic, regional, and international courts responsible for protecting freedom of expression. It seeks to achieve this mutually enriching exchange through different projects. So in 2015, the initiative introduced the global, the global Freedom of Expression Prizes, which recognized judicial decisions and legal services that strengthen international free expression. Columbia Global Freedom of Expression has also created the Global Database of Freedom of Expression Case Law to survey, examine, and to compare noteworthy cases and identify global or regional trends. The database now hosts 1,644 decisions from 131 countries. Last year, Agnes Calamard and I co-edited the book, Regardless of Frontiers. The book, book brings together experts from different fields 
to analyze how global norms on freedom of expression and information have been established, the actors and institutions that have contributed to their development, and the challenges they face. In keeping with its mission, Columbia Global Freedom of Expression is hosting this conference featuring conversations among, high, among justices from high courts and international human rights courts. High courts and international courts are critically important institutions responsible for defining the scope and the exercise of free expression and imposing limits on political power when it arbitrarily threatens those rights. They also play an important role in creating, interpreting, and applying global norms which are created by international legal standards and comparative law practices and can help guard against regressive trends. In the first session, we will hear from four respected judges as they offer their views on the role global norms have played in issuing decisions in cases involving freedom of speech. The second will focus on the challenges of protecting freedom of expression in the digital sphere. Please join me now in thanking our distinguished guests for being here with us today to share their thoughts and experiences on issues that are urgent, complicated, and of course, enormously consequential. With that, please welcome the moderator for the first session, Dr. Donna Schmaltz from the Max Planck Institute for Comparative Public Law and International Law. Thank you. Thank you very much, President Bollinger, and it's a great pleasure to be moderating this first panel today, the panel on the application of international legal standards and comparative law practices in deciding upon freedom of expression cases. Now, freedom of expression is a fundamental freedom. It is important as an individual freedom, and it has an important collective dimension. This, this year's uh, novel Peace Prize was actually awarded to two journalists, Maria Ressa and Dimitri Muratov, for their efforts to safeguard freedom of expression, journalists working in the Philippines and in Russia, respectively. But freedom of expression also finds limits in those cases where it might threaten the protected interests of other individuals. So courts, when deciding on freedom of expression cases, often face those difficult questions of balancing of deciding interpretation. So today we also have a global sphere of deliberation. We, many of those freedom of expression cases take place before a global horizon. And we will hear in this first panel today from judges and justices of high courts and Supreme Courts who are experienced in deciding on freedom of expression cases and in deciding in a global conversation. So it's my um, pleasure to introduce to you now the esteemed panelists, and we will then enter the presentations one after the other. We will be starting with Judge Stella Anukam, Judge at the African Court of Human and People Rights. Judge Anukam is a graduate from the University of Ife, Oyo State, Nigeria. She's a member of many professional bodies, a chartered arbitrator, chartered secretary and administrator, certified negotiator, and she has over 34 years of professional legal experience in public service with an expertise in international law and human rights. Then we have Justice Stephen Breyer from the US Supreme Court. He is a graduate of Stanford, Oxford, and Harvard Law School, and has taught law for many years as a professor at Harvard Law School and at the Kennedy School of Government. He was a judge at the United States Court of Appeals for the First Circuit, and in 1994 was appointed as Supreme Court Justice by President Clinton. He has written several books and articles about administrative law, economic regulation, and constitutional law, and I'll just mention a few of his books, um, which include Active Liberty, Making Our Democracy Work, A Judge's View, The Court and the World, and most recently, The Authority of the Court and the Perils of Politics. Then we will be moving to Justice Chandra Chud, a Supreme Court Justice from, from the Supreme Court of India. 
Justice Chandra Chud is a um, was previously a Chief Justice of the Allahabad High Court and a Judge of the Bombay High Court. He graduated from St. Stephen's College Delhi, from Delhi University and Harvard Law School, was admitted to the Bombay Bar before then becoming a judge of the Indian Supreme Court. Then we will have Judge Farrah McGregor, judge at the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. He, is, he graduated from the Autonomous University of Baja California and earned his Dr. Juris in the at the University of Navarra, Spain with a specialization in human rights. He held different positions at Mexico's Supreme Court of Justice and was ex Executive Secretary of the Drafting Commission for the Code of Judicial Ethics of the Federal Judiciary and representative of the Supreme Court of Justice of the Nation before the Venice Commission. He first served as an ad hoc judge in the Inter-American Court of Human Rights and then in 2013 was elected judge of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. And then last but not least, we will have Daniela Salazar Marin, the vice president of the Constitutional Court of Ecuador. She's a law professor at the Universidad San Francisco de Quito, where she served as vice dean and co-director of the legal clinic. She worked as a human rights specialist at the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights and holds law degrees from the Universidad San Francisco de Quito and also from Columbia University. So without further ado, I'll give the floor to our first panelist, Judge Stella Anukam. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, I don't have the screen. Thank you, moderator, and thank you, distinguished panelists and audience. It's my pleasure to be with. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here this afternoon, and I am greetings from the African Court on Human and People's Rights. The, this presentation, which is an online presentation uh, in an online conference, is uh, presented by me in the capacity of being a judge in the African Court on Human Rights, uh, where I was elected and took up responsibility there in 2018. <laughs> the contest. Um, the context of this presentation will be forced to give you a background history of the court. The African Court on Human and People's Rights is established in 1998, Wagagudu Protocol, which came into force in 2004. Officially, operations began in 2006. Uh, Why then the court was in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, before the relocation to the present seat of the court in Arusha, Tanzania. The first judgment by the court, uh, the first judgment on merit by the court was uh, delivered June 2018. And that case is the famous case of Tanganyika Law Society, um, Reverend Christopher Mitakila versus Tanzania. Although in that particular case, the focus was on the uh, rights on discrimination uh, freedom of discrimination, not expression. However, the jurisdiction of the court is unique because by virtue of Article 3 of the court, of the protocol establishing the court, the jurisdiction of the court extends to cases and disputes concerning the interpretation and application of the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, as well as the protocol and any other relevant human rights instrument ratified by the state's concern. So indeed, our jurisdiction is very wide. Like other international tribunal, the court applies the admissibility criteria uh, pursuant to Article 56 of the Charter, whereby we are expected to ensure that the, the identity of the complainer of the applicant is known amongst others, and then the issue of admissibility of uh, application uh, being brought after lo local remedies or domestic remedies have been exhausted 
as well as the application being brought within a reasonable time among so many other uh, criteria. Individuals and NGOs have access, have access to the court only where by virtue of Article 34.6 and Article 53.53 of the protocol, only in instances where the respondents to the, the state have made a declaration. So in our case, apart from ratifying the protocol establishing the court by state mem by member states, they are, other, they are further expected to make a declaration that gives access to the court by individuals and NGOs that, are, that have a recognition before the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. Permit me to also speak about the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, popularly called the Banjo Commission. Indeed, the African Charter on Human and People's Rights establishes the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. So that commission has been in existence as, as uh, far back as when the charter itself was, uh, was uh, promulgated. And uh, we have, a, we have there's the kind of relationship the, the commission has with the court, which is that of complementarity. And uh, in between both institutions in the continent, we can, we can receive cases from one another and we can also refer, we can also, um, we can receive and refer cases to, or applications to one another for determination. The functions of the commission uh, includes the promotion of human rights and protection of human rights, just like the court. And um, its mandate is categorized as being promotional and protective. And the promotional activities include appointment of special rapporteurs. So you can have, for example, a, rap a special rapporteur on freedom of expression in the commission. And then we they, do, they also conduct country visits, studies, researches on African problems in the field of human and people's rights. They organize seminars on human rights issues and make recommendations to governments. Um, it is a quasi-judicial body because even though they hear complaints uh, by way of communication, they can only give persuasive opinion. Uh, they are, their decisions are not uh, enforceable. And then <clears throat> this, um, the, the African Charter itself, which establishes the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, has been ratified by the 54 countries in the continent, except Morocco. Morocco recently joined the Union and it is yet to ratify the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. Now, I, I go directly now to the subject matter for our meeting, for our consideration and the conference this afternoon, which is the freedom of expression vis-a-vis -vis the African courts. Article 9 of the Charter is very key in this respect. Article 9 allows every individual right to receive information. And also Article 9 sub 2 also provides for the right to express and disseminate their opinion within the law. Within the law is that, that phrase within the law is a very contentious one, which I would, uh, I pray I will have time to allude to uh, when I begin to look at some of our decided cases. For litigants before the court, Article 3, 1, 3 sub 1 of the protocol um, establishing the court creates room to plead other relevant human rights instruments ratified by the state concerned. For example, we find situations like common to these three cases I'm going to talk about, where references, where uh, the ECOWAS uh, treaty, the revised ECOWAS treaty was pleaded as uh, uh, concerning freedom of expression and together with the International Con uh, Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. By the way, the ECOWAS, ECOWAS means Economic uh, Community of West African States. It's, 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 it's like a sub-regional body for West African states in Africa. So uh, thus far, we have three key judgments. Unfortunately, the situation is still the same as at today, even though these judgments were given uh, as far back as 2016. We, th these are the three key judgments in the area of freedom of expression, namely the Nobel Zungo uh, and others versus Burkina Faso. It's a 2014 case and it is reported in the African Court uh, Law Report 
volume one, to, uh, you find it at page 20, 219. And the second case is the Lohe Issa connected case, also against Burkina Faso. It's also reported in our law report, volume one. And the third case I will be uh, talking about is the Igabire Victoria Umuhaza case. This is versus Rwanda. It's also reported in uh, our law report, volume one. Now we'll talk about the first case, which is popularly called the Zongo case. In 1998, Nobert Zongo, an investigation journalist, and three of his companions were found burnt in a car in the outskirts of the capital city of Burkina Faso, Ouagadougou. It is believed that these murders had to do with a report due to be published by Mr. Zongo, in which he was to expose wrongdoings, especially corruption, involving the brother of the then president of Burkina Faso. For about a decade, precisely seven years, eight months, and some few days, this case lingered on at the domestic level. The pace was rather slow. At the time, the case was frozen, uh, but uh, suffice to say that the case prolonged for a very long time. And the importance of that uh, prolonged um, proceeding at the domestic court will come to light when we are considering admissibility, because it's one of the ground uh, Article 56 of the Charter provides for in terms of considering whether an application is a, is a, <coughs> will be admitted, is admissible or not. Uh, maybe I should just talk about that. Uh, in, in the African courts, uh, as I earlier said, Article 56 gives us uh, grounds to consider whether, whether to accept an application or not. And one of them is this issue of um, exhaustion of local remedy. And we know, and the court has established over time that we would hold that local remedy is not available, is not, um, is it, not enforced where it is not available. That is where there's a violation, and at the domestic level, there's no rem, there's no remedy, no rem, no process to remedy the violation. There's finally good process for the remedy to remedy or to redress such violation, and also where the where there is a remedy or a redress system, it is not effective. It is not sufficient and is unduly prolonged, like in the case of, of, uh, of Zungu. In that case, we hold that um, actually uh, there, there's, no, there's no remedy. In, in the case before the African court, the applicants, back to this case of Zungu, the applicants alleged violation of these rights. Article one of the charter, which has to do with respect for human rights. And, artic and article seven one, which has to do with the right to have one cause heard before a competent national court. And the right to equal protection of the law and equality before the law. And then article nine, as well as article 66, two sub C of the ECOWAS treaty, and Article 92 of the ICCPRO, which all are on the protection of journalists, and Article 4 on the right to life. So these were the um, the allegations by the applicant in his claim for uh, for remedy of uh, of these violations of these articles. Now, what did the court find? After an extensive deliberation, and uh, the court found that uh, Burkina Faso failed. Uh, and before I, I, I talk about the court finding, it's, it's important to note that in this case, Burkina Faso being the respondent state, actually uh, um, submitted their defense and it participated actively in the, in the hearing of this uh, case, even in the public hearing. So here, the court haven't had that, they haven't had both parties found that Burkina Faso failed to diligently investigate the killing of Zongo with a view to finding its killers and bringing them to justice, indeed. And that Burkina Faso had a duty to provide remedies where there is a human rights uh, violation. So though the, there was an investigation, indeed the, the state set up um, a committee, a commission to investigate, but they were not diligent. The court found that they didn't do so diligently. 
And then um, the second finding of the court is that the notion of victims must not necessarily be limited to that of years and can include other relatives who can be considered as having suffered moral damages. If you recall, while talking about the facts of this case, we recall that Zongo and his colleagues, they were, they are, they were already dead. So this case was brought by uh, the, the, the relatives of, of, of the victims. And the court also, note, also heard that failure to investigate Zongo's mother could cause journalists to work in fear. Applicants had failed, but however, the applicants had failed to prove that the Burkina, Burkina Bay media was restricted as a result. The court found that the respondent could not be guilty of violating the journalist's freedom of expression simply for failure to investigate the, the murder. Excuse me, Je Honorable Judge Ankam, I'm very sorry, the time is already um, at a close, so maybe you could come to a conclusion. Yes, I'll go to, can I, can I go to the, uh, how, like how many minutes, ma'am? The time is up for the presentation, but if you want to take one more minute to conclude or give you will have more time in the question and answers later. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me just go to the con concluding remarks, if you don't mind. Those, yeah. That would be good, great. It's so yes, concluding remarks then because of time. The court and commission's jurisprudence has been consistent in, vit in vindicating the freedom of expression for everyone and for journalists especially. There has been clear approach in assessing what may be limitation, restrictions on the freedom of expression in the African context, particularly in relation to Article um, 9, 9 sub 2 of the, of the charter that requires for, uh, that, make, that provides for a phrase within the law. The domestic utilization of the jurisprudence of the court and the commission is still limited. The court recently has been affected by withdrawals of, artic of Article 34.6, that is the declaration article. And then lastly, both the commission and the court, they suffer from implementation challenges. I thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, Honorable Judge Anukam. And with that, we are coming to our next speaker, Justice Stephen Breyer from the United States Supreme Court. Justice Breyer, you have the floor. Thank you very much and good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in this world. I think all of us and people listening to this have a strong belief that freedom of speech is an essential human right and democracy depends upon it. And of course, we should look at what each other is doing because that will be helpful. We'll learn lessons one way or the other. And uh, the United States has had the First Amendment, which protects freedom of expression for about 230 years. And if we go back 230 years, we'll see it didn't protect very much. John Adams uh, thought the Sedition Act was a very good idea, and the Sedition Act uh, stopped people from saying things he didn't like. Well, there's been change, and a lot of change. But we still have problems. That's hardly surprising for judges. I mean, judges are always facing problems. So let me do this. Let me mention one way. Let me make a textual point. And I'll make a point about approach. And then I'll make a point. I'll tell you a problem that I think we're having now. And, and you have it to a degree. And maybe we can learn something here. Um, the textual point is this. There's a difference between most of the constitutional or legal protections of human rights in the United States and elsewhere in the world. Why? Well, there's a good part and a bad part. I think the good part was in an article by Bert Newborn who pointed out how this protection is written. Now he said, listen to it. It's in the First Amendment, it starts, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. When that was written 230 years ago, Newborn says, 
it was about thought. Religion and thought were pretty much indistinguishable. And so really the founders were thinking of this, Mr. and Mrs. America, <laughs> think what you like. Then it says, no Congress cannot abridge the freedom of speech. See, after you think of something, you can say it. You don't have to say it. A lot of things are better not said, but if you want to say it, say it. Or abridging freedom of the press. Once you say it, you can communicate it to others. How? It's a big country, a lot of people, the press is necessary to do that. Or it cannot abridge the right of the people peaceably to assemble. Now, why is that there? Well, we now assemble, we're assembling right this minute. Because after our idea gets around, well then, we can talk about it together. And then you cannot abridge the right to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Now, you see what's there? Think about it, speak about it, transmit it to others, then talk about it with each other, uh, then tell Congress. And that way, Congress will have an idea what people are thinking, and that way the legislature in a democracy will reflect what people want and think and are discussing. It fits together. All right, I think that's a good thing. Easy to teach the students who have to learn it. Next point that isn't there, and this is a tough one. If you go look at the European Charter of Human Rights, what will you find? And you find this in lots of constitutions. They will have, yes, freedom of speech, but, but restriction is possible in the interest of national security, integrity, public safety, disorder or crime, protect health, protect morals, protect reputation of rights of others, prevent confidential disclosures, and maintain the authority and impartiality of the judiciary. We don't have that. Now, what it means in practice is when you're in a country, or say you're in Europe, there will have to be a balancing. Some people think that balancing is pretty good, as long as you remember free speech. And the balancing will be is the harm that this government is working to free speech. Let's look at that interest, how hard much is it being hurt, and let's see what the justification is, and let's see if the justification for the harm to free speech is proportionate. If it's disproportionate, law says you can't do it. Otherwise, you can. No, we don't have that. And instead, we have what I think of sometimes as something like the tax code. And I will spare you the details. But it's sort of one rule after another. I don't think rules work too well here. We know what the point of free expression is. And you get right to the point, I think, with proportionality, which is what most countries use. But we pretend not to use it. I think we really do. All right, so that's a difference in text. And it's a difference in approach. Now, keeping that in mind, let me turn to the third, which I think is important, at least in the United States now. Obviously, as you have just heard, in Nigeria, in many other places, the basic need to protect freedom of speech is just that, a basic need. When somebody says something that's politically unpopular, you protect it. When somebody goes to jail, because they don't like what he says, because he's advocating something the government doesn't like, you protect his right to say it. That's easy. It's easy some places, and it's not at all easy in other places. And that is a basic challenge. In the United States, it's probably easier because we have a long tradition. But, 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 what do we do with this kind of problem? a problem that sometimes goes under the name of hate speech. If somebody says something really awful about, say, a minority group or some other group of people and stirs up hatred, what do we do? 
Well, we know he can't stir up violence. If it's going to lead to violence, you're out of luck, bad luck, freedom of speech, no freedom of speech. Don't do it and you will be punished if you do. But what happens if it's not going to stir up violence, at least not immediately, it's just very unpleasant. And in the long run, it might contribute to dissension in the country. Well, there we have what Voltaire said. Voltaire, and we use this a lot in the schools, he said, I disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. Ah. By the way, Voltaire didn't actually say that. It was a woman who was his historian who actually created that phrase. And that's useful to know and very interesting. But the point's the phrase. And I cannot tell you how often I will have to say and do say to the students, because what we believe is not going to be carried on just by us. It's going to be carried on. It's got to be carried on by my children and my grandchildren. And so those are the generations we have to worry about. And I say, you know, freedom of speech is not there for people you like. If they're saying wonderful things, they don't need it. It's there for the people you don't like. Ah, even that? Yeah, even that. Now, that's a lesson that has become harder and harder to teach. Because if you're really willing to put up with that, if you really believe it, there are going to be people going around saying really pretty bad things. Maybe they won't, they won't stir up violence, but there'll be things that we really disapprove of. So how much do we believe it? And how do we teach the next generation? And how do we teach them not to, uh, uh, in the classroom, censor the students, 14 years old, who are saying things they don't like? Now, you see, I think for the countries and the places that have a more developed system of protecting basic speech, that remains a big problem still. And there are no easy solutions. And in Europe, they do not allow hate speech. They're much more intolerant than we are in the United States. In the United States, we're more tolerant of it. Why? Because in the United States, we're afraid of giving somebody, including judges, the power to say what is hate speech and what is not. Because the person who has that power might decide to use it, even if he's a judge, to censor things he doesn't like. So we say, leave it alone, let them free. But are they free in the schools? Are they free in a lot of places in the United States to say things that are in, unpopular at the proper time and place and not leading to violence and so forth? Are they better off in European or other countries where there's greater control over that kind of hate speech? Does it lead to a more better functioning society? I see then, in other words, to summarize, two big problems. One is the kind of problem that you've heard well expressed from the judge from Nigeria. How do we get these very basic things, these unpopular political parties, these opposition parties, there to be out there and not thrown into prison and have the right to say something? That is one big problem that will be agreed upon what should happen, but how you get it to happen is not so easy. And the second big problem, I think, practical problem, uh, is where we are right now in the United States of teaching younger generations this First Amendment is part of a democratic government and is part of protecting people whose speech you don't like. And uh, how far do we go there? And how do we do it? And how do we stop the censorship? I just mentioned those two problems. And I mention them because I do not have solutions. And I'd be very, very interested in anything else anyone wants to say about them. So there you have some differences of text, some differences of approach, but Similar problems across many parts of the world, 
and how we work on them, and particularly how we transmit what we think about them to children, to grandchildren, and to people who have to work in and solve the problems, including the democratic problems of this uh, world uh, so difficult that we have today. Uh, those are some of the things uh, that I will listen uh, with great interest uh, to what you say. Thank you very much, Honorable Justice Pryor. And with that, we move to the next speaker, um, Justice Chantachut of the High Court of India. You have the floor. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon and good morning and good evening. Uh, the Association of Free Speech and Democracy predates modern constitutions and international human rights norms. The classical Athenian democracy prided itself for being a protector of the freedom of speech. Plato noted that there was more freedom of speech in Athens than anywhere else in Greece. But Athens suffered many of the same flaws that modern democracies have to grapple with. More crucially, in the context of the freedom of speech, we can see that the Athenian commitment to free speech faltered when Socrates emerged as a proponent of unorthodox religious and political ideas, including his opposition to democracy for which he was put on trial. During his trial, Socrates famously announced that if you offer to let me off this time on condition, I'm not any longer to speak my mind. I should say to you, men of Athens, I shall obey the gods rather than you. Socrates was finally sentenced to death. The Athenian experience is emblematic of the moral coercion that societies typically exert on individuals to comply with expected norms of thought and conduct, which has been highlighted by John Stuart Mill in his seminal text on liberty. Mill argues that we need to protect the liberty of conscience, thought and expression of the individual for them to resist these social forces and pursue their own course in life, as long as they do not harm or interfere with the life and liberty of others. Thus, it becomes the duty of the court to intervene when an individual is persecuted for speaking truth to power. One of the areas where political power is misused to clamp down on free speech is journalistic freedom. While such an exercise of power can be politically convenient, it deprives citizen decision makers of valuable feedback that sustains a democratic polity. The Inter-American Court of Human Rights has held that it is the duty of the state to protect a journalist from threats and harassment. Otherwise, it will adversely affect the ability of journalists to report freely. The African Court of Human Rights, in a case involving imprisonment of a journalist under a criminal defamation law, held that defamation can be criminalized only in certain cases, and imprisonment of the journalist violated the right to free speech. In two different judgments, the Constitutional Court of Ecuador has stepped in to protect free speech of the media. The court held that institutions and figures do not have the same degree of protection of reputation or honor that private citizens possess in a case brought by the government against a newspaper exposing unreasonable expenditure of public money. In another judgment, it emphasized on the freedom of speech during elections. In a judgment authored by me, the Indian Supreme Court has recently upheld the freedom of media to report oral observations made by judges during court proceedings, where I observed that enabling a media to report court proceedings not only protects the rights of reporters, but is also a part of the process of augmenting the integrity of the judiciary and the cause of justice as a whole. Mill's individualistic account of liberty does not account for the systems of power within which speech is made. Social forces, culture and institutional practices shape freedom, especially freedom of expression, in particular contexts specific and in historically determined ways. The courts cannot turn a blind eye to the effect of their rulings on the political and social order. In a judgment which was authored by me on the issue of satire and the prominent place of satire in our public lives, I said, 
Satire is a literary genre where topical issues are held up to scorn by means of ridicule or irony. It is one of the most effective art forms revealing the absurdities, hypocrisies, and contradictions in so much of life. It has the unique ability to quickly and clearly make a point and facilitate our understanding in ways that other forms of communication and expression do not. At the same time, free speech under the Indian constitution is restricted by article 19.2. The restraint on speech that demeans, stigmatizes and incites prejudice against a vulnerable group of people also finds place in the Canadian and the South African constitutional model regulating hate speech. The harmful speech that is being adjudicated before the court that becomes reflective of the wider environment of marginalization and discrimination that exists against certain groups and further feeds into such an environment. The German constitutional court has also held that prohibitions on hate speech in federal criminal law are legitimate restraints on free speech. The German court does not privilege free speech over other competing constitutional rights and interests. In such cases, a court is required to balance the competing interests of free speech and the right to equality and human dignity. However, free speech can often advance the cause of equality and human dignity when the court intervenes to protect the freedom of expression of vulnerable groups who often find themselves in a hostile social and political environment. For example, the Supreme Federal Court of Brazil stepped in to protect the freedom to publish LGBTQ plus content when it ruled that the actions of a mayor to ban a comic book showing a kiss between two male characters is illegal. The court held that targeting of LGBTQ plus content by public officials violated the freedom of expression and the right of equal protection to all. A bench of the Indian Supreme Court of which I was a part, amongst other things held, that decency and morality Two of the grounds available to the state to restrict freedom of expression do not justify the existence of a law that criminalizes same-sex sexual intercourse because decency and morality cannot function as constitutional permissions for majoritarian government. The court further clarified that public displays of affection between members of the queer community are an extension of the freedom of expression. The Supreme Court of Colombia has recognized that the right to protest has constitutional and international protection and that authorities are responsible to ward off, prevent and punish systematic, violent and arbitrary intervention of the public force in demonstrations and protests. Though there may be jurisprudential differences between how speech is protected and regulated in the different jurisdictions that we come from or which our courts oversee, the values and the principles governing freedom of expression have global currency. The strength of this transnational dialogue may not always be visible through explicit or expressed judicial acknowledgements. However, it often shines through the growing harmony in judicial voices across state boundaries. A transnational judicial dialogue can be useful in widening the scope of materials and practices that a domestic court can take inspiration from. There have been many instances where the Indian Supreme Court has drawn on comparative jurisprudence while adjudicating on constitutional issues involving free speech. American jurisprudence, for instance, was utilized by our Supreme Court recently when we struck down the provisions of Section 66A of the Information Technology Act of 2000, which made the publication of information through a computer resource or communication device, which was grossly offensive or menacing in character, caused annoyance, inconvenience, or obstruction. We relied upon the classical clear and present danger test enunciated by the American Supreme Court. Then in another case, we have clarified that customary international law that does not conflict with our municipal law would be deemed to be incorporated in the domestic law of India. Finally, we've also acknowledged that the approach adopted by the European Court of Human Rights in protecting freedom of expression is not different from that of Indian courts 
do as Justice Breyer just mentioned a short while ago, they have an extensive list of circumstances for limiting freedom. There is no denying that comparative constitutionalism and international law are increasingly playing a role in constitutional adjudication by national courts since issues of social and political emancipation transcend geographical and political boundaries. The march of this transnational judicial dialogue in an increasingly global world is inevitable. In fact, it is a welcome occurrence since through our judgments, we are able to speak to the wider international community on constitutional principles, values and aspirations and learn from each other's experiences. Perhaps in the time of pandemic, we as judges realize that we are not isolated and alone in the work that we do. So in conclusion, I can only say this, that whether it is in the right of a woman to seek an abortion or in the legal conflict over the refusal of a cake shop owner to serve a wedding cake to a person of the LGBTQ community, the freedom of expression is the foundation of our right to a life of dignity. In doing our bit to protect free speech, judges enhance the right to human dignity. The courts are, of course, not the only fora where a dialogue between national judges takes place. Judicial dialogue takes place in international conferences and seminars as well. Hence, the conference organized by the Columbia University has given me this opportunity to engage with my counterparts in other jurisdictions. I would once again like to thank the Columbia uh, Global Freedom of Expression Initiative for inviting me to share some of my thoughts this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Justice Chandrachut of the Supreme Court of India. And now I hand over to Judge Farrah McGregor of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. You have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Dana. It is, a, it is a great pleasure and privilege for me to share this distinguished panel with fellow judges from the African Court of Human and People's Rights, the Supreme Court of the United States, the Supreme Court of India, and the Constitutional Court of Ecuador. First, I would like to thank Professor Lee C. Bolliger, President of Columbia University, in addition, I would like to express my gratitude to professor, uh, professors uh, Roberto Saba and Catalina Botero, Columbia Freedom of Expression Chair, who organized this important conference that gathers the voices of judges from regional human rights, supreme and constitutional courts. In its more than 40 years of existence, the Inter-American Court has been a key actor in the fear of freedom of expression. As a judge and former president, I would like to highlight some contributions of international standards on freedom of expression and try to summarize some of the regional trends on the matter. I will continue my presentation in Spanish. In general, La contribución del sistema in interamericano general, the contribution of the inter-American system is quite important when it comes to freedom of expression, not only the court itself, but also the inter-American commission, which is a quasi-jurisdictional body that uh, is in Washington, D.C., and how, also how it reports as to freedom of expression, also the inter-American court, which is the jurisdictional body that is uh, in a, based in Costa Rica. The Inter-American Court initiated its jurisprudence in 1985 in a consultative opinion, or a con consultative union, which is one of its uh, competencies when it comes to norms, not only to rule on some cases, but just to um, advise on certain norms. Uh, Costa Rica presented a case on the obligation of um, journalists to be collegiated. Uh, that was clear that uh, freedom of speech, freedom of expression was the cornerstone of democracy. It was decided on the Inter-American uh, Court. Since then, the Inter-American 
Court has interpreted Article 13 of the Inter-American Convention that regulates freedom of expression and thought, but also based on the Inter-American Charter and other treaties, other regional uh, instruments, and also including uh, a very enriching dialogue with other international courts and also domestic courts. Altogether, when we analyze this jurisprudence, you know, the issues have been very diverse when it issues like access to information, uh, film censorship, limits of criminal law, uh, the relevance of the media as a vehicle of uh, vehicles of freedom of expression and also the illegitimate restrictions of uh, on such when it comes to uh, running for election, the op political opposition, issues related to the right to uh, having the, to the truth, the, the rights to of people to express themselves in their native tongue, the freedom for political opposition and journalists, inclus including forced disappearance, protection of workers when it comes to relationships between private parties, um, issues such as uh, informed consent, and more recently there was an issue of gender-based violence against a journalist, a female journalist. Uh, there are around 30 cases or so which had had a tremendous impact in the region and which have led to normative changes and said jurisprudence and also has changed public policy. Um, I will try in the next few minutes just to focus on four fundamental aspects. Number one, in indirect restrictions. Number two, corruption and freedom of expression. Three, protection for journalists, which unfortunately in Latin America, this is uh, uh, tremendously uh, important. And number four, issues that have to do with the independence of the judiciary in general and magistrates in certain contexts. Well, firstly, um, indirect restrictions. In some states where there is a democratic weakening or there are there is an institutional crisis, they use means that are apparently legitimate to restrict freedom of expression and to silence dissident voices and op the opposition. These res indirect restrictions have been broadly addressed by the court. The court has developed the concept of um, deviation of power, actions of the public policy that in by the book they comply but they have uh, an uh, motivation that will harm the freedom of expression one uh, case is granieri at all against caracas or radio caracas because the government did not renew the license the radio license of um, this tv station the Inter-American Court considered that this was a what we called a deviation of power that had an impact on freedom of expression, not only on the shareholders and the employees of the channel, but against the Venezuelan society as a whole, because there was a use of a power allowed by the state, which is to uh, regulate uh, the media with, with an illegitimate right, which is to align that a media outlet with the government's opinion. Another emblematic case is San Miguel Sosa against Venezuela, which has to do with the reprisals suffered by people who signed the Tascon list, which is well known, that gathered signatures of those who supported a referendum to impeach the uh, then president Hugo Chavez for the court. Uh, once we established, uh, there was a clear division of power because there was a clause in the contract as a pretext to uh, cover 
the actual intention, which is to generate a reprisal against him because he had exercised a, a political right, which was perceived by the high uh, official as an act of, um, of political disloyalty. And then I will talk about freedom of expression. We can say that there is an interconnection between the rule of law and the develop of such, and they reinforce each other. This is recognized by the goal of a sustainable development uh, of the United Nations, which, uh, which is about uh, having a more fair and inclusive societies. The court, and I will just talk very uh, very briefly there's the case of alvarez ramos from 2019 when they determined that the uh, uh, penal um, code should not be used when it comes to the right to honor personal honor uh, in 2013 this journalist published an article in a venezuelan newspaper in which he was talking about alleged irregularities on the of the uh, of a public bank by a high uh, by a government official. This article led to a penal case against Alvarez Ramos, and the courts considered and set precedent a criminal case when they pointed out that this punitive response through criminal law would not was not possible, especially in context as such, in order to protect the honor of public officials. The third issue in the region that we need to take into account is protecting the standards or the standards to protect journalists. The courts have pointed out the role of journalists and they've decided to exercise the right of to expression as their uh, livelihood. So all uh, journalists and the court has said that journalists are subject who are vulnerable. Therefore, they require a reinforced protection when the state is aware that there is danger uh, when they do their own job. However, uh, there are many cases. I don't have enough time to discuss them all. There is the Peroso case and others where the court reviews a number of violent acts against a TV channel and the court pointed the obligation that the court had to protect journalists, but also pointed that high public officials were making statements against journalists in Global Vision by and then this exacerbated this uh, intolerance and rejection by the population against them. Vélez Restrepo and Family Against Colombia, for example, is another case. There is a cameraman who was attacked by the members of the National Army after having filmed military attacking people who had participated in a public demonstration. More recently, we have the Carvajal Carvajal case against Colombia, 2018, about the murder of a radio journalists who had been investigating alleged act of local corruption as also uh, alleged irregularities in the public administration uh, relating to money laundering, laundering proceeds from uh, drug trafficking. On 18th October this month, the Inter-American case court also has another case that's important, Bedoya Lima against Colombia, which is about a well-known uh, journalist from Colombia, Jeanette Beloy Bedoya, who's also a known activist, and she's known to uh, defend the rights of female journalists. This is in 2000, Ms. Bedoya was kidnapped at the doors of the La Modelo jail by a paramilitary group. She was subject to a abuse and violence. And she suffered verbal and physical and sexual violence. This is the first case in which the court 
acknowledge this type of attacks to female journalists and the pandemic has been important because we have statistics and there's been an increase in attacks to female journalists. In this line, the court considered that the impact of this violence to society, there were different because the person who had, was attacked was a female journalist. We must mention that the court based itself on standards above beyond the American Convention and used other standards, uh, even using some of the words of the special rapporteur from the Inter-American Commission, because there is a the existence of an exclusion of female um, participation in the public lives or in the uh, media agenda. The court uh, mentioned the importance of the need to have plurality in the media because as the former uh, relator of freedom of expression said earlier, who is also coordinating this seminar, Dr. Catalina Boctero, and let me quote her. She was also a witness for this case to silence female journalists. And when you do, you silence the stories that are usually only told by women. So finally, I think this is an emblematic case and it established uh, means to not repeat and reparation and also uh, positive obligations such as to identify and, re and investigate due diligence of these specific risks that are specific to female journalists. And because of that fact, also factors that increase the likelihood that they will become victims of violence. It also took a gender perspective when it was would take steps to guarantee the safety of female journalists, among others. And very briefly now, because I think my time is running out. Yes, but you could conclude, Oliver, that, uh, that would be excellent. The time is about to end. Ah, perfecto. Solamente of course, uh, just uh, to conclude. Finally, we talk about the independent courts and the freedom of expression to the uh, judiciary. There were some cases that are emblematic and the court has established in the case Lopez Lone, for example, there is a context where you break, uh, where you uh, have the, 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 the judges have the right to defend democracy as part of their freedom of expression. Uh, I'll conclude, but first I'd like to say that this year's agenda includes a case, two cases in the Amer Inter-American Court, one on community indigenous radios, uh, a case of the Mayan people, uh, the Cachipel people, and Zupango against uh, Guatemala. This is the first case of an indigenous community radio and two, the El Universo newspaper versus Ecuador. Thank you very much. Hello, Judge McGregor, Sarah McGregor, and with that, we are moving to our last speaker of the panel, Daniela Salazar Marin, the Vice President of the Constitutional Court of Ecuador. You have the floor. Muchas gracias y buenos días. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. I would first like to greet all the members of this panel, those judges that have preceded me, Judge Chandra Chu, Judge McGregor, Judge Anukam. I'm very honored to share this space with you, with all these judges of uh, uh, such importance. I'd also like to thank President Bollinger and Caterina Botero and for generously inviting me to this event. I would have loved to have this event in person, of course, so that I could come back and visit the Columbia University campus. But I must admit that this is a timely uh, uh, event in order to talk about the role of courts to protect the freedom of expression, particularly the way in which courts, when deciding these cases, use or do not use global standards on freedom of expression, some from international law and human right law and others from 
comparative law. The constitutional law of Ecuador often uh, goes, uh, uh, uses the case law from inter-American law and also on comparative uh, case law when we determine the breach of these rights, including the right of expression. Because the Constitution of Ecuador in 2008 respects the international uh, law on, interna on human rights, it talks about the treaties and in an international instrument many times. It is a mandate of the Constitution to use the treaties and international tools for human rights and incorporate them into the Constitution. And they are very, very privileged and they can be directly applied by judges uh, or public authorities in the country. Naturally, constitutional justice has also used the treaties, international treaties, or and or uh, jurisprudence of human rights in order to protect rights. The right of ex, uh, freedom of expression, of course, is one of them. Uh, in this very few minutes that we have, I just want to share uh, one case in which the Constitutional Court of Ecuador has used the standards of the inter-American system and the uh, compar comparative law to decide a case on freedom of expression. I will talk uh, about the case as an example. I think the case was already mentioned by Judge Chandra Chus. It's the uh, decision on the Diario de Naura. I'd like to briefly tell you the relevant facts of the case. There was an NGO which had its own monitoring as to how much public money had been spent on official advertising and showed the numbers to the press. So uh, they went to a press conference and published a report saying that it was clearly numbers that were obtained by this organization based on its own monitoring as to how much the government was spending officially. Immediately, the government sent a letter to this newspaper saying these are false because I've gotten discounts. There were no proof as to these discounts, but it said the, the, these are the official numbers of public expenditure and they're different from the ones that the newspaper had. So what did the newspaper do? They published the government's response. The government at the time was not particularly respectful of the freedom of expression, but the government came to the constitutional justice uh, for a uh, case and it won in the first and second instance. The judges who heard the case decided that the uh, government had the right to have true information honor and the right of the government to ratify. So they forced the media to publish a apology and uh, uh, the case came to the Inter-American, excuse me, to the Constitutional Court where I work and the Constitutional Court in, in ex, uh, uh, issued a decision uh, revoking the previous decisions and uh, holding the rights of the newspaper for the freedom of expression throughout the uh, uh, the sentence, if you read it, you can see the impact of international global standards, uh, such as the Inter-American Court, for example. It, it has been cited throughout the decision to clear that the state is not uh, does not have inherent rights, so it cannot stipulate. It tried to explain the role of the media as a vehicle for expression and uh, the dissemination of information, we cite the standard to determine that we have a specifically protected speech in order to explain the uh, tolerance level for public authorities and to determine the right to uh, reply and how does that relate to the freedom of expression. Particularly, it also decided on the right to have true information. I have very little time, so let me just talk about the last point, which I think illustrates uh, something for this panel. For those who don't know the judicial system in Ecuador, I must say that one of its specific characteristics in the constitutional text 
of 2008 in Ecuador is that it's very detailed and almost like a rule. Our constitution does not limit itself such as, as, it, as the US uh, constitution mind to uh, abstract, but rather article 18, number one, when it uh, protects the right, describes it as the right to look for, receive, exchange, produce, and disseminate. And it says information that's true, verified, timely, con in context on facts and uh, general interest matters. All of that is specifically uh, written in the text of the article in the Constitution. And based on that article, the sentence of the first and second instance protected the government and the state in terms of its right to true information. But when the constitutional case looked at the case in order to determine how to apply this article of the constitution, the constitutional court uh, reasons this out and says when there is a declaration of the principle of the freedom of expression approved by the uh, Inter-American Commission, it says that to condition the, the conditioning the information such as impartial or true is a principle that is incompatible with the right to of the freedom of expression. So the court sees this tension in this Article 18 in this international norm and the international standards on freedom of expression. And as a basis of its decision, the declaration of principles is used by the court to interpret its own constitutional norm in terms of the right to having true information. Because you cannot understand article, the article in constitution will a priori exclude protection of freedom of expression if information doesn't comply with the conditions and those conditions should not be used as justifications to censor any type of speech. So you can see how an article in the constitution that talks about the truthfulness as a condition to protect the right to disseminate information is interpreted in light of a declaration of freedom of expressions, even though that is not a treaty. Inter-American Commission is the body that's been authorized to interpret this treaty as a, the authority, but the constitutional court did not focus in the uh, judicial value of the recommendations of the Inter-American uh, Court or anything like that, but rather in the fact that the recommendations allow the court to interpret the norms of a constitution more favorably. And in that same uh, sentence, court the court uses the uh, standards of a faithful uh, reporting so that they say that the information, the original information published by the newspaper wasn't going to be interpreted. It decided that in future cases, judges must also consider that if you reproduce information or declarations by a third party, it, you cannot be subject to a judgment of your truthfulness as long as you cite the source and unless you can prove that the expression was made maliciously or with the intent of damaging because of because you knew that the information was uh, false or now in terms of real malice is not really a standard for the inter-american system it it originates in the new york times versus sullivan case of the supreme court of the us so this standard of real malice has been expressly expressly used by other courts in argentina mexico or colombia and of course it has been used by the inter-american court of human rights there's been some uh, criticism in the way that the court in Ecuador incorporates real malice as our, into our system, not just because of the difficulties to apply this standard in our context, but also because these norms are not the result of a democratic decision by our representative body. So, so in this specific case, I think it's obvious that the use of global standards was crucial to protect the right of expression. And I also think that the argument about the, there is no democratic to, uh, validation to include our uh, international standards is wrong because our constitution gave us that. 
perhaps we need to ask ourselves why these interpretations that are favorable to the international uh, interpretation of human rights are so difficult because if that's the basis of human dignity, we shouldn't have so much resistance, but the backlash is real. I have to wonder, perhaps this resistance is because courts have gone too far or is it because this judicial dialogue has become a monologue? I think in this space, I know I don't have enough time. We were asked to share our personal opinion separately from our decisions. I personally think that we need to listen and deliberate on the reasons other courts have given you when you have to decide a similar case is, act, is beneficial because as a result, you can have a common interpretation as to the content and importance of rights. And I think if all courts would do this, then we would have consensus and we would have more actors and more views when we have to interpret something and we would have a shared interpretation of the rights and this this uh, interpretation based on judicial dialogue and comparative or inter-American dialogue could, I think, lead us to have a better protection of these rights. As Judge Breyer says, we have a lot to learn from each other and humans are have, have to protect their rights two times, conventionally and constitutionally. And if judges would focus less on the hierarchy of the norms or of the text of the law, if we stop thinking about rights in their international dimension or constitutional as if they were isolated or separate, then we could maybe reinforce and increase the potential of constitutional justice to change reality and protect these rights. But the problem is that we don't always do this. Okay, I'll conclude. Judges don't always commit to have to reinforce protection of these rights frequently. Unfortunately, we just use case law and comparative law just to reinforce these allegate, uh, arguments. And I think if we use internet, I don't think it's enough to just quote or cite other law. We should question the reasons in the uh, lo case law that we're quoting. So we would have the best solutions, solutions that would be closer to what we want justice to be. And we would have to resist the idea that standards, just because they come from elsewhere, are better or more or, or are the last word. I think we need to rethink what makes a norm or a standard, what makes it uh, a, 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 what makes it so that we should respect it. I think we need to keep this dialogue, a dialogue so that we can interpret rights. We can't just consider that definite definite and let but they are constant construction together and not only court should be part of that dialogue the dialogue shouldn't just be among judicial elite this judicial dialogue should find ways for other actors such as for instance journalists can become part of this dialogue to build together what it means to have these global norms that protect us. So once again, I'm happy to, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased about this initiative by the Global Freedom of Expression in Colombia. And, the, and I hope we can continue this uh, dialogue and this exchange. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vice President Sandra Marie. And thank you to all the speakers of the panel. This was really excellent and has given such good overview on specific questions of your jurisdiction, but also already raised several points where questions arise in general or are even coming up in an interrelated way. And we have now about 15 minutes for some questions and answers. We unfortunately, Dutch Anuka had to leave already, but we will have a little time among the four remaining speakers. And I welcome you all to also in your answers to the questions I put out uh, to react to the presentations you've heard. This is really a time where you can also interact to the presentation of each other. But I will start with a question to Justice Breyer. And you have spoken about the differences between many European jurisdictions and the United States on how hate speech is uh, scene. And more generally, I think you've pointed out how difficult it can be to engage in comparative law to 
look at other jurisdictions and their decisions because they're ruling on different constitutional norms. And I want to ask a little more also based on the presentation of Justice Chandra Tud, who spoke about the phenomenon of satire and such general uh, phenomena that are not necessarily immediately rooted in legal norms. So I wonder how much inspiration do you draw from the decisions and the reasoning of other courts and how much do you view developments such as internet communication, maybe also the increasing uh, dangers of hate speech that come with it. How much do you uh, view those in dialogue with other jurisdictions, other high courts? Right. You oh, have, you yes. Have yes, sorry, I um, should have said. There are differences. There are, take some right. time to respond. there are differences. But underlying the differences are basic principles uh, that people are free to speak and print in the press. And that's an essential element of democracy. So, but I think many of us, and, and less in some countries, more in others, are uh, can deal with the differences as long as they stick to the basic principle. And uh, the, the problem for many courts is is what I usually think of in Shakespeare, uh, where uh, Hotspur, who's the English general, meets Owen Glendower, who's a Welshman. I've written this a lot. And the Welsh general says, he's a Welshman, so he's a mystic. <laughs> but he says, uh, I can summon demons from the vasty deep. And Hotspur says, well, um, so can I. So can any man. But will they come when you do call for them? And I say that's the problem. It's easy to sit in an office and say that the government should not shoot general journalists. That's an easy thing to do. Uh, not so easy in some places. But once you do it, will people say, OK, we're going to punish them, or we're going to compensate the journalist's family, or we're going to see that it stops? That's the difficult thing in many places. And that requires the idea of the basic principle being there. But teaching it to enough people who aren't doctors and lawyers so that they see it is an essential part of a democratic, uh, of a democratic process. It, it is an essential part of a government that takes them into account. It's an essential part of a democracy. That basic principle we all think. And our point, I think, in getting together uh, is that we sense that and we can discuss a few of the problems of getting that implemented in various places and how could the others help. Thank you very much, Justice Breyer. And I have a question to Justice Chandra Chud. I was fascinated by how many references you brought up to other cases, to a case from Ecuador, to several other jurisdictions. And I have one question is, how much has this use of comparative law increased over time in your work? Is this something that is also a growing phenomenon or has it been throughout the years that you work as a judge uh, or that you're at the Indian Supreme Court? And can you maybe tell a little bit more about the practicalities of this? Comparative law is so challenging. One has to understand so much of the other legal context. So I would he like to hear a little more. Uh, well, I think uh, across uh, the last 70 years uh, and more that our Supreme Court has been functional since we gained independence, there's been a lot of dependence on comparative law. Uh, we began, say, with the American constitutional law. We, of course, draw from the common law traditions of the UK. And we've now expanded the reach, not just to common law jurisdictions, but to civil law jurisdictions as well. And uh, the reason for it is that increasingly, technology has brought our societies so close together because geographical or political boundaries really seem to be absolutely illusory in the context of uh, the kind of technology that we all uh, live our lives in. 
And I think particularly in the context of uh, technology, the traditional divide between the civil law and the common law systems is slowly but very surely uh, coming to an end because that divide, I believe, is uh, evaporating. And uh, we, we've made extensive references to comparative law. In, uh, for instance, there was a challenge to the biometric uh, project of the government of India, where every citizen has to be uh, thumb, uh, his iris uh, or her iris uh, pr uh, has to be photographed. Your thumb imprints have to be taken as a means of identity. And uh, we drew extensively on jurisdictions such as, you know, uh, Germany and uh, the European Court of Human Rights, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. So that that is, I think, a product of the kind of age in which we uh, in which we live. Um, you asked me about satire before that, and um, I'd only say this: the satire is a powerful form of expression because there's something about the imagery of satire which makes it so powerful. Now, when satire is used against the government, the judge's task is, I believe, a little easier because you are protecting the right of the person who speaks to criticize government and use satire. It becomes more problematic when satire comes up against popular models, against religious beliefs, uh, because then satire comes, about, comes against uh, the intolerance in our societies. It's easier to defend satire versus the government but when satire is pitted against the intolerance in societies and the growing trend, the growing tendency to homogenize societies into one particular frame, that is where I think the judge's role is very, very critical. And comparative law gives us uh, some food for thought and some ideas on where we can stretch the limits of our law in our own societies. Thank you very much. And I'm moving to Judge Farrah McGregor with a question. And I found particularly interesting that you spoke about all the indirect restrictions on freedom of expression. And there we are in a very wide range of um, possibly affected areas. So I would like to ask a little more on that and also ask in that regard how much you and your practical work as a judge have been looking at the decisions and reasoning of other courts and whether in those indirect restrictions that really touch upon a lot of areas of law, um, you have found that the uh, comparative dialogue has been helpful or useful. Muchas eh, gracias. Thank you very much for the question. Yes, okay. Thank you very much once again for the question. Of course, indeed, one of the main issues that the Inter-American Court has addressed is the issue of indirect restrictions. And this derives from the actual Inter-American Convention, Article 13, um, as Justice Breyer was saying, there are differences when it comes to the uh, um, um, European Convention. In the Inter-American Convention, it should be compatible. This is not an absolute right, the freedom of expression, but it should be admissible, such restrictions, when they comply with the ends of a democratic society, and this restriction should be one, should be legal, should be timely, necessary and proportionate. And this is what we analyze in our courts case by case. And this text has been adopted by the respective Supreme and Constitutional Courts and also regional uh, human rights courts. So that the Inter-American Inter -American, uh, Court and its convention in Article 13.3 says that we shall not restrict the right of to freedom of expression through them indirect means, such as the abuse of official controls of particular works for paper, of journalists, of radio frequencies. Uh, this alludes to the case I was talking about earlier in my presentation, or devices that are used for the dissemination of information or any other media or means uh, that would lead to the dissemination of opinions and information. The court as such, part of the, the convention says, and it also analyzes what uh, the European court um, says, and its, uh, its decisions are very rich in the matter. 
and its jurisprudence, in order to interpret the convention, it has established the Inter-American Convention on Human Rights. This is not a jurisdictional body, but it has established its standards and such standards can be useful in order to interpret the convention. So in my experience, our courts uses uh, um, sources that go beyond the Inter-American Convention in order to resolve and rule on cases when it comes to indirect uh, violations, which are just one of the issues that we are talking about today. I have a last question to Vice President Salazar Marin. And you brought up the international law as an additional source in safeguarding freedom of expression. And I'm wondering, or I'd like to hear a little more on how you think about this relationship of constitutional interpretation of in international law, maybe specifically how you relate to the Inter-American Court of Human Rights and how this often is seen as a danger of interference also when there is a court ruling on international law and it has effects on the country. So in this interpretation of freedom of expression that touches upon so many political issues, how have you experienced the interaction between constitutional and international law? Thank you very much for the question. As I was saying, our own constitution is absolutely receptive when it comes to international law and human rights international law. Our own constitution mandates that we perceive and read our um, constitution, which has tons of article 444, but that's not the extent of the constitution. Beyond the text, we have a constitutional block where we incorporate all the international treaties and instruments. That means that as such, we cannot read the constitutional articles in isolation. We need to interpret them in conjunction with international uh, jurisprudence and rulings from the Inter-American Courts of Human Rights, for example, who, who interpret such treaties. This generates tension, of course, because on many occasions, as the case that I was presenting earlier, there's a constitutional norm that maybe comes into conflict with uh, international human rights uh, norms. In our constitutional court, we try to see, not to see which one carries more weight. And I don't think that necessarily the Inter-American Court always has the last word. I, we, don't, we do not believe this is necessarily the case, but we do believe that it's necessary to take into account the, its interpretation to ponder such arguments. And if such arguments can provide more protection of these rights of uh, our people, of individuals, then we apply the, this interpretation regardless of the hierarchy of the sources. In many cases, what we do is try not to interpret such rights or norms as if they came into conflict with our law, but as, as a complement, as if they were complementary. I'll give you an example that it, it does not pertain to freedom of expression, but I think illustrates this. Our constitution, for instance, defines um, the uh, uh, marriage as a uh, marriage between a man and a woman. When uh, our court ruled on equal marriage is to link this marriage between a man and a woman, along with the ruling from the Inter-American court and incorporated then same-sex marriage. So there's a much broader uh, perception or interpretation. I don't think they conflict. Um, but they complement each other, so we can actually provide better rights, a more favorable interpretation of these rights. This is not always as possible. There's a lot of reluctance, there's a lot of resistance towards this way of interpreting this source of the law. Um, but I think we need to give better arguments. We need to not only use the source as if it was just the last word or it was uh, the, the authority in the matter, but actually to provide arguments as to why this is a more favorable interpretation of these rights um, and have this dialogue. I think in the Inter-American uh, Court, while in some rulings and consultative opinions, makes an effort to establish a dialogue with uh, high courts, the respective high courts in Latin America, it, it does, it's not all this effort is not always uh, enough because it doesn't feel like it's a, 
uh, a dialogue between peers. Uh, it's almost it's not like a monologue sometimes when it comes to the inter-American courts. So we need to strengthen this dialogue uh, as peers, as equals. And I think we can advance on this sphere as such. At this point, I want to thank all the honorable judges for this very fruitful exchange. This has been an incredibly enriching session. And I, um, I, I feel this dialogue that you at the end also, also emphasized uh, really took place for a moment here. So I want to thank you. And we have a five minute break before we'll move to the second session that will be moderated by Professor Bruce Rubio Marin. Bruce Rubio Marin is a full professor at the University of Sevilla and a part time professor at the European University Institute with their School of Transitional Governance. And before we start the second session, however, we have five minutes of break and thank you all again.
Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the second session of the conference Quotes and Global Norms on Freedom of Expression, organized by Columbia Global Freedom of Expression and the World Leaders Forum. We will now address the challenges for the judicial protection of freedom of expression in the digital sphere. So whether linked to the fact of the fast and global reach of the dissemination of expression, or to the fact that more and more people, and especially the young, rely on social media as means for mobilization, but also as sources of information, we observe certainly some opportunities, but also growing risks. Risks connected to misinformation campaigns, to the dissemination of hate speech and other forms of harmful speech, or to the public disclosure and manipulation of private data and information. Such risks are confronting us with unprecedented regulatory challenges for the protection of many fundamental rights, such as equality, freedom of expression, and privacy, among others, and the sustainability and health of democratic institutions. In particular, these regulatory challenges are connected to the inevitable public-private interface dimensions in the matter, to the transnational dimensions, and to the cultural implications which are necessarily present when it comes to drawing lines separating acceptable from harmful speech. In light of this, the question for us now is how should judges deal with these challenges? How do they cope with the fact that their ordinary tools, the body of law and doctrine, they have at their disposal have been shaped in the pre-digital era. And to address this and more, we have today a truly distinguished panel of three honorable judges, which include uh, Carmen Lucia Antunes Rocha, High Justice of the Supreme Court of Brazil. Welcome. Justice Darian Pavli, High Justice of the European Court of Human Rights, and Justice Alejandro Linares Cantillo, High Justice of the Colombian Constitutional Court. So the way we will proceed is as follows. I will allocate each judge uh, 13 minutes roughly for the presentation. We ask them to stick to time because we would like to save a few extra minutes so that I can present the justices with a couple of questions actually coming from the student body that were passed on to me and also maybe give them the opportunity if they manage to fit that uh, within three minutes altogether to respond to something that they might uh, wish to respond to in reaction to something one of their colleagues has covered in the presentation. So without further ado, I will now give the floor to Honorable Justice Carmen Lucia Antunes. Bom dia. Good morning to all the organizers of this important forum, excellent judges, ministers, especially the students that are participating in this forum, and as a root in the personal Ruth Ruben Marine, I'd like to thank in name of the Supreme Court of uh, Brazil for this opportunity for a forum organized for a debate that is so current and so important of such a challenging theme such as the issue of freedom of expression in these times on new platforms new ways to look at things i'd like to first uh, give you a few uh, observations Yeah, all the challenges that are being presented uh, to the uh, contemporary uh, into constitutional judges. First is regarding freedom of expression. I'd like to present something about the Brazilian reality that is not unique, but it has its own unique characteristics like any other people. I'd like to make some uh, remarks about this change. Uh, in the constitutional law in a world that is uh, changing even in this notion of time and space basically using this technology 
not only in constitutional law and basic fundamental rights, but also in the practice of constitutional judge dealing with this and the impact and use of these platforms and these democratic tools in the Brazilian process in the uh, and the electoral processes which is forms the foundation of democracy and are transformed due to these platforms and use the utilization by all citizens I would like initially sorry for interrupting you do you think you could add the other your piece thank you so much I apologize. Thank you very much. Initially, I would like to, as I said, uh, talk about the what we have happening in Brazil because the impact of these platforms is going to be different historically. At this juncture, we are reflecting basically about the issue of the freedom of expression and the use of these uh, digital platforms and their impact in the people's and institutional lives. We're still going through a, a pandemic period, also a political pandemic, as I call it. We, uh, our, I'm sorry, the interpreter is having difficulty uh, hearing what the judge is saying. That we're doing our best. The people were using more and more these technologies, public and private institutions, and even democratic institutions, and people in their living rooms. Suddenly, they have the notion that they can't talk anything about what they know or they don't know. NTV that disseminates live all the decisions of the uh, federal Supreme Court. People that didn't have have didn't have the information, don't receive it. Started to manifesting themselves. Justice Antunes, I am really, really, truly sorry to interrupt you again, but it seems that we're still having some problems with uh, hearing you and hence with translating. So what, what we're going to do is that we're going to interrupt you. Unfortunately, we're going to have uh, Justice Pavli take the word. And then as soon as we fix your audio problems, we will revert to your presentation. We apologize. Hello. I hope you can you can hear me okay. Hello to everyone. Uh, it is a real pleasure to be part of this uh, forum. And I would like to start by thanking the, the organizers of this event. Uh, the Columbia University and the Global Freedom of Expression Program, uh, with which I've had the pleasure to uh, collaborate in different capacities uh, for a number of years. Uh, in the time allocated, I will try to uh, provide a brief a summary of the main lines of case law of the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, I'm afraid it can only be telegraphic in, in, in the time possible, uh, but I will do my best. Uh, let me say uh, a few words about the European Court of Human Rights uh, in, in general terms. As you may know, the court has jurisdiction over uh, 47 uh, high contracting parties in the European space, broadly defined, uh, which covers uh, with a combined population of 830 uh, million people. Uh, which I think uh, gives the court one of the largest constituencies in the democratic world, uh, perhaps uh, second only to the Indian Supreme Court, uh, which we had the pleasure to have a, a colleague uh, present today as well. 
uh, one of the, the themes of, the, of this fascinating discussion so far has been whether we can find uh, common ground in interpreting freedom of expression in our very different, uh, sometimes uh, political and cultural contexts. And what I can say is that uh, it is part of the very fabric of the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, one remarkable fact about it that is despite this uh, diversity, uh, we have managed over the years to find much in common uh, in uh, interpreting uh, the guarantees of free speech and other fundamental rights uh, under the convention. It has been one of the highlights of the day for me, especially many of the colleagues have already referred to the jurisprudence of the Strasbourg court. But I think one highlight has been to listen to Justice Breyer reading out the second paragraph of Article 10 of the convention and the uh, permissible uh, restrictions, limitations uh, on the fundamental right of free speech. And uh, while that, that list is there, and, and it is a rather long list, I think it has been part of the challenge and the task of this court to make sure that those restrictions are themselves interpreted in a limited fashion. As the court has said already in the early days of its jurisprudence, we have now about 5,000 cases interpreting Article 10. Uh, it is the, the fundamental guarantee of free speech that remains the rule and that the exceptions uh, cited in the second paragraph are, uh, are, are uh, just that, are exceptions to be interpreted narrowly uh, in view of the principles of proportionality and necessity in a democratic society. And I emphasize that last part because it is, is a fil rouge that permeates uh, the jurisprudence of the court. Turning now to the uh, more specific topic, I'd like to focus uh, on four areas, time permitting. One is on issues on intermediary liability. Secondly, on blocking of access to online content by government actors. Uh, thirdly, what is known, at least in Europe, as the right to be forgotten. And finally, uh, uh, protection of journalistic confidentiality in the online environment. Uh, intermediary liability, the question of, was put, how do the courts and the society as well deal with imposing traditional notions of publisher liability uh, to these new uh, online actors uh, that uh, uh, in many ways uh, operate in very different ways. Uh, it is worth noting that uh, in Europe we do not have an equivalent of uh, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act in the US which grants rather categorical uh, immunity to uh, online operators. What we have in Europe is a system, uh, as you may guess, a rather uh, more middle of the way system of conditional immunity or a safe harbor uh, for the operators. The central concept developed by the court in this area is whether third party speech is manifestly illegal. And if that's the case, whether sufficiently prompt action has been taken by the operators to take such illegal content, manifestly illegal content down, uh, especially where a complaint has been filed by an affected party. Uh, the leading case in this regard is Delphi or Delphi versus Estonia, where the, uh, which involved anti-Semitic speech and threats of violence, which were posted on a major commercial news portal um, and the court decided that in that case, the portal uh, could be held liable for not taking such content down uh, quickly enough and there had been no violation of Article 10. However, there is also a long line of cases. Uh, Delphi is the one that is uh, most often cited, but there's a long line of cases starting with MTE and Index versus Hungary, where uh, a third party speech that was not considered to be manifestly illegal, for example, involving defamatory matters, um, and where there was relatively swift reaction by the uh, uh, operators of the website in relation to this third party speech. Uh, in those circumstances, Article 10 would not permit uh, the civil liability 
on the part of the operators. Um, I think another interesting case that is worth mentioning is quite recent is uh, Bezaras and Levitskas versus Lithuania, uh, where the court found that national prosecutors and courts as well had declined to pursue criminal prosecution. We've talked about uh, uh, hate speech quite a bit uh, in, uh, in our discussion so far. This, uh, this was a case where uh, national courts and prosecutors had failed to pursue criminal pres uh, prosecution of Facebook users who had made streng, uh, strongly homophobic comments. And in those circumstances, the ECHR found that the decision not to prosecute in itself was, was vitiated, was marred by anti-gay bias. And that led to a violation of Article 8 of the Convention, which protects psychological integrity, as well as the prohibition on discrimination in Article 14 of the Convention. Uh, and finally, you may also find uh, of interest a recent decision of the fifth section of the court in Sanchez versus France, which involved the liability of a politician for not taking down um, racist speech uh, uh, left by, by users on his Facebook profile. The second set of issues uh, dealing with the blocking of access to content online by government actors uh, and in particular with a focus on uh, what's known as collateral blocking and filtering. This is uh, uh, an area involving mostly Turkish and Russian cases. And here the court has treated blocking as a form of prior restraint and imposed a relatively high threshold or a fairly high threshold. In fact, it requires a strict legal framework providing for blocking in limited cases Secondly, effective judicial review. And finally, proportionality in the methods of blocking or filtering in order to minimize collateral harm. Moving on to the next set of issues on the right to be forgotten. This is increasingly recognized in Europe, including by the other European court, the uh, European Court of Justice in Luxembourg, as the right to request the, the deletion uh, sort of the right to, in a way, to erase exposure to one's own negative history if uh, the data is no longer relevant. Uh, and one of the leading cases from the court in this respect is ML and WW versus Germany, where the applicants had been convicted uh, many years before for the murder of a famous actor, and then upon being released, as sought an injunction against three media to remove online access to prior publications, uh, which also mentioned them by name, and therefore uh, seeking a right not to be permanently exposed to a spent conviction. And this was a case where the court uh, fundamentally agreed with the assessment of the German courts, including the German Constitutional Court, and finding that there had been no violation of Article Right where the German court of Article 8 of the Convention right to private life, where the German courts um, had refused to grant these injunctions. The ECHR uh, emphasized the importance of press archives and also the fact that the applicants had in recent years actively sought the limelight in efforts to get early release. Um, however, it is worth mentioning that in a recent case, Herbain versus Belgium, which was decided my my own section, section three of the court, uh, the, uh, the, the, the court uh, reached uh, the opposite conclusion um, by finding that, uh, by endorsing essentially the decision of Belgian courts to order um, anonymization of digital uh, press archives uh, in a case uh, involving uh, uh, similar grounds, a spent criminal offense. Uh, I should note, however, that uh, this case is not final and is currently pending. It has been referred to the Grand Chamber of the Court, and so it will be taken up by the Grand Chamber, which is the, the, the highest judicial making body of the court. Um, and let me also mention another uh, case that is uh, currently pending before the Grand Chamber, also by Section 3 of the Court, uh, Halle versus Luxembourg, which involves whistleblowing in the private sector uh, which is the first case of its nature uh, uh, decided by the court. 
Finally, uh, let me turn to the question of protection of uh, uh, confidential journalistic materials. Uh, there is a long line of case law that uh, includes very strong protections, I, I, would, uh, I would argue, uh, in terms of journalistic uh, privilege. Uh, but in this particular case, uh, Big Brother Watch versus the United Kingdom recently decided by the Grand Chamber uh, the court had to look at it in the context uh, of what is known as mass surveillance or, or bulk surveillance in some contexts, which is operated by uh, primarily the intelligence services in the online environment. Um, and what the court, uh, the court decided in this case was that uh, in order for uh, 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 this to be possible with respect to journalistic material uh, protected by, by privilege, there had to be a specific authorization by an independent authority, both when journalists are targeted deliberately and when data is protected, uh, is, is captured uh, in an inadvertent fashion. Uh, so again, rather quite telegraphically, those were the, the four main areas that I wanted to touch upon, uh, but of course, uh, uh, even though we've had dozens of cases touching on internet issues, there's still uh, important uh, questions related to freedom of expression in the online environment on which the court has not yet had an opportunity to deal with. These would include, for example, uh, the liabilities, if any, potential liabilities of major global uh, platforms with respect to speech that is harmful to others. Um, uh, as well as speech uh, that is so harmful that can or, or manipulation of information that can represent a major threat to a country's democracy. And finally, um, the question of what we would call in terms of Strasbourg case law, whether there is a right of forum in relation to major platforms. In other words, what rights, if any, do we as users have when the platforms uh, undertake actions that are adverse to our freedom of expression, like taking content down uh, or blocking accounts. Um, I think with this, I've, I've probably used uh, my time, but uh, if there is interest in some of these uh, um, areas that I mentioned towards the end of my presentation, I would be happy to come back to them during the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Justice Pavli, for your rich presentation and for sticking to time. And we're actually now going to give the floor to Alejandro Linares Cantillo. Uh, we're still, I think, struggling with, with the audio uh, that would allow us to listen to the third speaker. Justice uh, Cantillo, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the Colombia Freedom of Expression. Uh, a World Leaders Forum, and thank you very much to Catalina Botero, who invited me to, to this uh, forum. I would like to share with you uh, recent cases regarding uh, freedom of, expre of expression in the digital area. And then after um, uh, summarizing uh, some of those cases, I would try to, to make some conclusions regarding uh, the challenges that we face as, as judges in this area. The first case that, that I would like to share with you is a case uh, of two, 2019 known as, as the Kika Nieto case. Uh, Kika Nieto is a, is a Colombian influencer uh, of 28 years old. Uh, she has uh, 8 million followers and uh, she posted a, a, in YouTube a video expressing her views as a Christian uh, questioning LGBTQ, uh, the LGBTQ community dissenting with the homosexual relationships and showing some, some, some sort of a gender bias uh, in this regard. Uh, after this uh, video in YouTube was posted, then uh, a newspaper blog known as Las Igualadas posted a, another YouTube video entitled Erika Nieto, Kika Nieto Head Hates Gays and Lesbians Despite 
denying it. And the defendant uh, is uh, uh, this uh, post by, by Las Igualadas, uh, owned by a newspaper, by El Espectador. And then uh, the plaintiff is Kika Nieto. Uh, she, she filed a claim, a constitutional claim, saying that uh, the, the video on YouTube uh, violated uh, its uh, reputation, its good name and, and honor. Uh, the court, the, the case uh, went to the court. Uh, the court had to look at the two videos, which was uh, really interesting. And the, the holding of the court was that the, the, the video by the newspaper uh, did not exceed the limits of the right of freedom of expression. And uh, therefore, uh, that the, the second video did not defame the, the plaintiff. Uh, interesting in, in the analysis of the court was, uh, first of all, uh, the application of, of uh, the freedom of expression right in between a newspaper uh, and an influencer when the influencer has more followers than the newspaper. So the, the court tried, did some sort of a balance between the, the number of followers of each uh, expression and said that, uh, that in this particular case, the influencer uh, could have uh, replied directly uh, to the other video without recurring to the constitutional uh, judge. Uh, that's, that's very important in the sense that uh, uh, this type of, of, uh, of fights or, or uh, differences of, of opinion uh, in the context of the digital uh, platforms uh, has become uh, an interesting issue as, as we will see. There are more horizontal application of fundamental rights between private actors rather than uh, between the state and, and a private a private citizen. Uh, in this case, the, it is also important that the court distinguished uh, between freedom of information and freedom of opinion, indicating that freedom of, of information is subject to tr truth and impartiality. Whereas uh, in terms of uh, opinion, everybody has, has the, the right to hold opinions without interference uh, from the constitutional uh, judges. Uh, the court also said in this in interesting case that historically discriminated groups such as the LGBTQ community should, ha should have a higher protection under constitutional law and should be protected from, from this type of, of, uh, of defamatory speech. The second case also involves uh, fact patterns uh, related to uh, an interchange in Facebook and, and YouTube and, and Google between private persons. In, in this case, uh, is what, uh, what I would call horizontal conflicts. That is two private parties uh, fighting uh, for uh, uh, protecting their, their honor or their good name uh, using uh, platforms. And uh, the court in, in this case, uh, also of uh, 2019, uh, analyzed the potential exce excesses of free, uh, freedom of expression on the internet. And the court said that uh, those statements have to have constitutional relevance in order to be assumed by the, by the constitutional judges. And uh, the fact that there are some uh, public recognition and significant audience on the, on the part of, of the different actors that uh, inter interchange opinions or information in, in the, on the internet uh, will, uh, if they have impact on the public concern, they, they might trigger the intervention of, of the constitutional judge. But the interesting thing here is that uh, what the court says is that the repetition or the repetitiveness of the statements and the offensiveness of the statements uh, would 
or might trigger an abuse of the freedom of expression right. And therefore that should trigger at the same time, the intervention of a constitutional judge. Uh, it is interesting uh, that the court has, has been uh, very reluctant to intervene in these horizontal exchanges of, uh, of opinions. Besides uh, the court, as, as Justice uh, Breyer had indicated before, our court, uh, when there is a, uh, a balancing of rights between freedom of expression and other types of rights, such as uh, good name or reputation, uses uh, the so-called, the well-known uh, strict proportionality test. Um, and so the court uh, used this uh, proportionality test uh, to solve these cases. In the end, uh, the court decided uh, not to intervene. However, it said that the, the repetition and the offensiveness of the statements might trigger its intervention. Besides, uh, the court in an auditor dictum uh, studied uh, the liability of intermediaries, indicating that social media platforms and search engines uh, bear no, li no liability whatsoever for the content posted by, by the users, uh, but uh, said that uh, in occasions, if there is a court order to remove the content uh, that is posted in a platform, uh, the, the, the search engine or the media platform has to comply with, with that order. Uh, finally, there's another case of 2020 in which there is also these cases of interpersonal conflicts. And, and my view of this case, this is ruling T031 of 2020. Uh, there is also in this case, interpersonal conflicts uh, that are uh, exacerbated by the use of, of social media. And uh, the court has indicated that this type of horizontal interpersonal conflicts, uh, that is conflicts between individuals with no Notor notoriety that are not public officials uh, should not uh, lead to constitutional relevance and therefore should not trigger the intervention of, of the constitutional uh, judges. Going to, to my conclusions from, from these uh, three recent cases regarding uh, horizontal issues of uh, freedom of expression. Number one, uh, the Constitutional Court traditionally has uh, emphasized that the freedom of, of expression is essential in a liberal democracy. Uh, that's uh, part of the jurisprudence of the court, but also, as, as was indicated by, uh, by Judge Ferrer, the court also follows uh, the jurisprudence of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights and the European Court of Human Rights and uh, assumes that uh, the right of freedom of, of, of expression is protected not only in the Colombian constitution, but also is protected by all, all international and regional human rights instruments that are part of, of our constitution, as was indicated uh, by Daniela uh, we have a block of constitutionality in Colombia, so the international human rights uh, treaties are part of, of our constitution. Another, the challenges that, that we have is, first of all, uh, how to, to deal with the horizontal effects of freedom of expression. In other words, if there are two private actors, how should the constitutional judge intervene? And here we, we believe that if there is a high disproportion in power or, or in number of, of followers, uh, there should be some intervention of the constitutional judge applying uh, a balancing test using the, the proportionality uh, test that has been uh, used. 
Uh, there, there are problems uh, regarding the liability of intermediaries. We have to, to focus on that. Uh, there is also some problems of, of territorial jurisdiction. For example, uh, Google, Facebook, uh, Twitter, uh, those uh, platforms or, or those, uh, those uh, companies do not have, uh, their, their domicile is not in Colombia. So when we order a certain type of uh, removal of contents, the question is whether or not there would be voluntary compliance with our orders that uh, might have an extraterritorial effect. Uh, so this uh, trans-jurisdictional uh, communication is not, not easy. Um, and uh, the other areas in which we should see our challenges is in the application of, of contract law, because most, uh, for example, Facebook and Twitter have uh, terms of service. So when you want to remove contents, contents, you have to exhaust remedies under the contract before going to a constitutional judge. Uh, there is uh, some cases talk about addition contracts, that is contracts that are not negotiated between the parties. And last uh, but not least, uh, we are thinking about applying antitrust uh, regulation when there is a, a high difference between the private uh, parties that are in, in conflicts in the digital era. Those are my, my reflections. Uh, it's too little time, but I'm happy to, to undertake uh, certain questions. And uh, thanks again to Catalina for providing me this opportunity. Thank you. Justice, I think it was an extraordinary, <laughs> rich presentation uh, showing some of the fascinating questions uh, when we take the Drittwirkung and the horizontal effects and we apply it to uh, scenarios where um, new forms of private power are, are affirming themselves versus traditional forms of, power, of private power that we were used to seeing um, limited by these horizontal doctrines effect. And many of the pending um, issues that you highlight regarding liability issues and the intermingling of public and, and private law, which is inevitably part of the equation. I think we're now ready, finally, to listen to our Justice uh, Carmen Luisa Antunes. The floor is yours. Mais uma vez, cumprimento os organizadores deste importante. Again, I would like to thank all the organizers and I apologize for the inconvenience of uh, issues that are inherent to these platforms, not only in the legal but in technological area. Sometimes it's, we have a good or bad performance. In this case, I apologize. Uh, I'd like, besides greeting and thanking the Professor Luz Ruber for this opportunity to be here. I'd like to in the first make a few observations. In three items, number one, the uh, structure of freedom of expression within Brazilian uh, democracy and uh, recent Brazilian experience, because differently from other countries, uh, discussing this issue and in Brazil, we are under a uh, constitution that uh, came about after many years of an authoritarian regime in which we had a total lack of uh, freedoms and a, a f freedom of expression. And that's why that within a new constitution Constitution translated a new moment that the Brazilian society and citizens uh, to express themselves didn't have a voice before. Whoever had went through this knows how much it hurts to uh, have your voice suppressed. So we have a lot of care to the freedom of expression because this is a uh, still open wound of my generation that had to be uh, uh, had their 
freedom of expression repressed and it's important. Brazil has this historical uh, data and uh, this history of living without freedom of expression and people disappeared, they were tortured, they were even killed to exercise this right. So I would like to briefly uh, reflect on this new reality of democracy with the new platforms and the private and public spaces, public and private institutions. This affects on one side the, the right to in, intimacy, honor, and privacy of people. For some people, they have, they think they have so, they think they have so much rights that they think that they can say whatever they want in uh, uh, social media and freedom of expression. Our Supreme Court has been dealing with this for very directly. I'd like to make some. Brazilian democracy is representative, but our elections are completely electronic. They depend, therefore, on these platforms, of these technologies. We are still developing or have been developing this for two decades to get to a completely fully electronic elections. Therefore, these platforms, in our case, an institutional data of presenting and administer elections and everything through electronic platforms and also institutionally through these platforms. So I'd like to uh, very quickly just situate freedom of expression within the Brazilian Constitution and the Supreme Brazilian Court as a theme that is important and very prominent. Prominent. Our Constitution just uh, completed 33 years in effect, and this constitutionalization, as I said, appeared after a very hard period of authoritarian authoritarianism when you didn't have any freedom of expression, whether the private citizen or some of our greatest educators, thinkers, artists had to leave the country. Some were exiled, others had no condition to live like that. Doing There was a previous censorship, even to songs that could not be released. So there was no form of expression that was exposed without the state or the authoritarian state uh, conducted the censorship that branded the, my uh, generation before mine and my generation of uh, law students that to listen to certain songs by Caetano Veloso, Gilberto Gil, Chico Buarque, I had to hide and that was hidden so you could appreciate art. So freedom of expression in the reconstitutionalization of the Brazilian state it's a very, uh, it comes with a very a lot of strength. We conquered our freedom saying that we wanted to speak, to see in politics, in society. We didn't want to, as citizens, and especially, if, especially as women, we couldn't be, we didn't want to be invisible anymore in a fake democracy that only had a, a name in the text Therefore, the 1988 Constitution, that is the one in effect, uh, emphasized, and there is a disposition between the basic rights that guarantees freedom of expression and prohibits anonymity, but says that anybody can express themselves free from any action from the state. And there's even this position in the Constitution that forbids expressly any kind of censorship. This is uh, something that as a constitutional judges, we have in consideration to judge even, for instance, cases in, in a platform, in a social uh, network, somebody expresses themselves uh, regarding another or criticizes public or, per, or private institutions or people that are acting in these spaces, public or private. This is not common in constitutions that has an impact in our decisions because we don't want needed to go back to censorship of freedom of expression. Uh, 
And as a constitutional judge, I've been learning to explicit and interpret well, which for us, what for us is freedom of expression is the expression as a manifestation of the exercise or an exercise of freedom. But I have been learning with these new platforms that expression could be a weapon when you uh, commit a crime with another person. Uh, and we have today what well, we have a uh, what I call a digital digital Western norms, uh, policies regarding freedom of expression are being utilized by people who practice crimes in uh, social networks and these platforms exactly in detriment of the rights of others. And the Brazilian case, as I said, when you have a freedom of expression, there was a conquest of two or three generations so we could have access. That means that as constitutional judges, we have to weigh what is somebody's freedom of expression against censorship exerted over others that cannot be admitted in the Brazilian system. And very briefly, I would say that this uh, Supreme Court has been uh, put uh, to action several times, whether by people who think they have been offended in a privacy by the exercise of these social networks, whether because for our elections, as I said, the candidacies are presented and programs presented by uh, social media and not uh, in person as it was used to be, because we want to ensure that everybody has uh, the right to informative self-determination, people who don't know what's going on and have the, we have a test of civic information to have, uh, to exercise your political rights. But on the other hand, we have, in many cases, abuses even against the democratic institutions. Democracy has this feature that's uh, different from any authoritarian regime. It does not extinguish. It does not eliminate who is against it. It lets others manifest themselves or express themselves. It doesn't uh, let that compromise the uh, democratic process that has been coming to the uh, Supreme the attention of the Supreme Court of the Brazil when many people, citizens themselves, have been acting against institutions, even against uh, to of offend democracy or risk the democratic process. Been saying in the Supreme uh, our Supreme Court, number one, the freedom of expression or as expression of freedom, establish some parameters beyond which is not the freedom that is being exercised, but the use of these platforms in detriment of our institutions and putting in risk democracy itself. In the last elections uh, last year, 2020, we called the uh, providers of these networks to the court so we could establish together the standards and uh, behaviors that they would, at the end of the day, be liable for. So we have in Brazil the assurances that uh, elections would be held with uh, equal access by all citizens. Of course, some people have better access to others. They can uh, introduce certain algorithms and false ideas. On the other side, we have a system to control social media during the electoral period or period of elections so that we can have assurance that all candidates and all the electors have equal conditions of access to social media and, uh, and, and, and true information. The federal system or the federal government established a, an organ to control veracity of uh, information that is disseminated via social media. So in our site of the Supreme Court, there is a, uh, uh, a section about everything that has to do with uh, sentences pronounced by Brazilian judge that could be uh, considered fake, could be 
corrected in the site of the Supreme Court itself so the citizens can know what's fact and what's fake. But I had no doubt that my biggest challenge as a constitutional uh, judge, and next year we have presidential elections in Brazil as a federal judge, three ministers of the Supreme are also in the uh, electoral supreme electoral court and the, our biggest challenge we will have in the near future will have to be prop, have some kind of proportionality what the, uh, the risks to this freedom to on one side and uh, democratic guarantee to a full manifestation by the citizen without any embargo to the democratic and election process in the, the Brazilian state as I said it's a recent construction these are only three decades that we've been ensuring freedom, but our wounds are still still open. Uh, however, we know as constitutional judges, we know there is no arithmet arithmetics. We, we can't use, you can't level mathematically what is freedom of a, a person to expose their ideas and be against uh, what they need to be changed and the guarantees that their expression will only be considered constitutionally legitimate if they don't eliminate or compromise the freedom of another, but especially that it doesn't risk doesn't risk the Brazilian democracy. I think that's the main issue. There's been a lot of uh, growth in the access uh, to these. Uh, to the social media, especially during this pandemic. But as I say, our COVID pandemic cannot become a uh, digital political pandemic without in the space with without norms that are established so that people can be assured of their right to express themselves, but also to have their individuality respected that this does not take place without have a judicial power over these uh, matters. I would like to thank the opportunity again to be here, um, Professor Rubio, all the professors. And again, I apologize for the initial problems for the misuse of, uh, of this platform. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Justice. It was in a, a very interesting and um, quite illuminating um, account of the active role that courts can take when they see social media becoming the uh, domain, the political forum, and the ways in which this can threaten democracy. So now I have, uh, I have um, the pleasure to give the floor back to you. And uh, what I thought I would do is I would share with you two questions that have come from the students. And I will let you choose between addressing you know, those questions or if you wish reacting to something that you have heard your colleagues talk about that you think is particularly interesting and or disturbing. Um, let me briefly refer to the question sent by the students. There were two. Uh, the first one is the following. When drawing the line between acceptable and harmful speech, cultural value judgments seem inevitable. How do you navigate the challenge of drawing such lines in multicultural and multi-religious societies? And what to make of the fact that in the digital era, expression almost inevitably has a transnational reach? So that is the first question. Second question is, what is the role of judges in regulating social uh, private media companies in order to end hate speech online while still maintaining users' freedom of speech? So I will, you have each of you has three minutes. I will give um, Judge uh, Darian Pafli the word first, react to these questions or to anything else that you've listened to. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, maybe I'll uh, touch upon uh, an aspect of the second question, uh, which is the, the overall regulation of the private media companies and their impact 
uh, both at the individual level, at the rights of uh, individuals who may be harmed by the speech of others, but also at the level of the overall health uh, of our democracies. I think this also touches uh, upon uh, the, the point that was uh, raised uh, quite a few times by the colleagues and in particular by uh, Justice Linares Cantilla, which is the horizontal effect. And the first point I would make is that um, this horizontal effect, it's, it's quite uh, familiar to those of us uh, dealing with these issues in the European context, as well as the jurisprudence of the court, um, the, 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 the terminology we use uh, as an international court is that of positive obligations on states. And the court has identified many kinds of positive obligations in uh, the balancing that is required between free speech and other values. For example, the court has uh, uh, recognized that there's a positive ob obligation on the states to create an environment that is not hostile to journalism, for example, to take steps to protect them from, from violence. Uh, but of course, the same can be said in the balancing that is done between free speech and, and, and privacy or reputation uh, that all, uh, most of the time occurs at the horizontal level. And to be honest, it, it is probably not very different from what, um, for example, the US Supreme Court has done in, in New York Times versus Sullivan. Of course, through the angle of Congress shall make no law, but ultimately uh, affecting and, and modulating uh, the balance between the rights of public officials and those of journalists. With respect to the platforms, I think that this is one of the big uh, unresolved questions of our era. Uh, what rights do we have? Um, we know that they serve as uh, gateways to public discourse to a very important chunk, uh, uh, increasingly important chunk of public discourse. Um, this affects ordinary individuals, but uh, it also involves uh, pe uh, people vested with public power. And I think this was most evident in the recent, uh, well, some time ago, the decision, uh, for example, of Facebook and Twitter uh, to block the accounts of the former president, well, the then sitting president of the United States. So that is some uh, formidable power. I don't want to suggest in any way that there was a decision that was taken lightly. And there is a long uh, decision of the Facebook Oversight Board, which includes some very uh, widely acknowledged experts. Uh, but I think it is an illustration of how much there is at stake, that this is a question that cannot be left uh, solely to questions of private law, of contract law, in terms of service and community standards, and that sooner or later, uh, it is a question that at least to some extent needs to become uh, justiciable and subject to the judicial review, because uh, it is simply too important to be left to questions of contract law. Thank you. Thank you very much, Justice. Justice uh, Alejandro Linares. Uh, I think uh, I will also take the, the second question because uh, this is some, something that uh, I've been thinking about, which is how to find solutions uh, to these new issues uh, uh, brought by by the internet uh, because the internet increases the the effective opportunities for all people to communicate their views nationally and internationally and that uh, brings us to 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 take from from the, the existing law uh, ideas or institutions institutions such as the horizontal, effects um, among private actors. The same uh, goes uh, with the, the, the balancing interest uh, through the proportionality analysis, which is the approach that uh, uses the court to, to solve the, these issues. But my view is that the, the solutions to, to some of these uh, new issues might uh, 
simply be the application of the existing rules on, on freedom of expression without a significant modification, um, but of course with, with certain adjustments uh, to adjust or to address uh, certain emerging problems of the freedom of expression. I believe that the platforms uh, allow us to have uh, uh, to express our views, uh, but that requires certain limits uh, using the, the balancing approach. But uh, the issue with, with private uh, actors with a lot of power could be one, one issue would be self-regulation or, or one, one solution would be self-regulation as Facebook, Facebook has done with, with this panel in which Catalina is a member, or uh, also apply the theory of uh, addition contracts, that is contracts that are not negotiated in which there is one part with more power than the other part. And then in the interpretation of those contracts, you would favor uh, the party that has uh, less power. And even in, in this context, uh, uh, th there is a higher importance uh, for the right to, to privacy. Uh, finally, th the difficulty arises from the enforcement of uh, decisions at the multinational level. In other words, a decision by a court in Colombia that has, has to be implemented or enforced in the United States, uh, it means that uh, there should be voluntary compliance uh, because I, I see it very difficult to have the enforcement of, of a constitutional judgment, judgment in another part of the world. Thank you, Justice. And now your final minutes, uh, Justice and Tunis Rocha. Thank you once again. I would like to also uh, say something about the second question. I would like to call your attention as my own. First, we have the relationship between people that are one side. Uh, one person who expresses the other person that thinks that has been impacted with that on the other and side necessarily by that, uh, could could be affected by it when the judiciary power cannot that respond to that with certainty with the celerity that would be that necessary. is necessary so and these are the like circumstances that while the executive the power circumstances that while the executive the present, act for the, the present future, perspectives for the future the legislative, the legislative makes talks about the future we, the future, at the judiciary us, level, and the judiciary we talk about the past power always something already happened back then there there was already a manifestation in the social media and someone was already insulted and impacted and while we act in this velocity well, we this. of uh, social media not always has their they have their uh efficient the judicial response sometimes the no the news there's another approach in the social media judiciary is parsimonious because it has to do has to deal with the past but the past is too close and we don't have that velocity so this is a, something i would like to include here is that we are talking about also about the validity of the effects of the social media but i was a uh, reporter at the Supreme Court some months ago about a, a request made from a citizen who asked me to determine that the president of the Republic had excluded him from the Twitter to readmit him because the president of Brazil, as in other countries, uses that as a manifestation, a political manifestation a publicly, which, which is, uh, you know, making public his decisions at the palace where he lives and he runs the country. Now, this is the, I have the right to be there and determine that uh, that the, the 
president be re-included if he uses that space as a common uh, citizen is one thing but also he says if i was a judge using the twitter to to, regarding my instructions, I would have to include that when everybody has the right to be there. That's a decision that is isolated yet here, but there were other cases that we have didn't have plenary sessions on those. But what is horizontal and what is constitutional? What is vertical in in, in the matters of platforms? And and the first were a concern that I have is that the this the greatest struggle in my life if to fight for equality i had a very modest childhood and i was able to go to school my father was able to to maintain me as uh, as i went through law school so i had the opportunity to reach the supreme court of this country i don't want the children and brazilians have do not have the digital education so they don't have equal rights and i don't want this pandemic to see women to have them lock them in their homes without access to media and there are aggressors who are who are living to them and there she's not able to uh, denounce these aggressions because she has no access to those digital means so we're talking about the judicial power at the supreme level but also at the uh, first level judge because we had to be distanced from each other because of the pandemic, but the judge talks to the woman that has been attacked and she has a, uh, and the, her, the cell phone is held by the aggressor actually, because what assurance am I given of, to equality? I don't wanna be 30 years from now that the judges that are in my place are, have to face this again to deal with new technologies that were not coming to promote the equality of people at least at the existential level and i think that uh, as judge alessandro you already said technology has come to also uh, provide information but also to make things more equal and i thank everybody else Thank you to everybody. Thank you for bringing up uh, the digital divide, which is something we, we didn't have time to touch upon, but it is, of course, at, at the core of our concerns. And I think we, our time is uh, up. I want to thank our honorable judges. From from uh, Catalina Botero from Columbia University, from Columbia Freedom of Expression, and co chair of the Facebook and Instagram's Oversight Board. Catalina? Thank you very much, Professor Rubio Marin. It has been a real honor for us at Columbia Global Freedom of Expression Initiative to host this uh, conference. I want to thank the Honorable Justices for their extraordinary presentations. Uh, they have generously helped us um, understand how they face current freedom of expression challenges. I would like to thank also our two distinguished moderators, Professor Dana Schmaltz and Professor, uh, Professor Ruth Rubio Marin. My deep gratitude to Professor Roberto Sava for his wonderful contribution to this meeting. And I especially would like to thank the Columbia Global Freedom of Expression team, Barbara Schreiber and Holly Johnson for their invaluable support in organ uh, organizing this conference. Our gratitude also to the World Leaders uh, Forum for co-hosting this event and to UNESCO for their huge support. And of course, to more than 500 attendants who have joined us today from all around the world. Nowadays, justices are one of the most important guarantees of freedom of expression. That's why I would like to close this conference by paying tribute to those judges who with courage and wisdom have protected our rights from the authoritarian impulses unfortunately increasingly widespread. They deserved our gratitude. Again, muchas gracias, muito obrigada, 
thank you very much, all of you, for joining us today. And I hope we will meet again soon at another conference of the Columbia Global Freedom of Expression Initiative. Thank you very much. <laughs>